Hi right, everyone, this is Tim, your Block 3 Lecture Instructor, and this PowerPoint voiceover is on renal failure. Um, you're going to find in this PowerPoint that there are two types of uh, renal failure um, or injury. Uh, one of them is going to be um, an acute injury or failure, and that's usually caused by something that, um, and I hate to use the word simple, but something as simple um, that can easily be fixed and allow the uh, patient uh, to kind of return back to normal. With chronic renal failure, um, something has been um, affecting the body or the kidneys for such a long time that eventually they aren't able to recover and eventually give out. Um, so acute is probably more or less, you know, three months or less, and usually caused by something that's fixable. Whereas chronic is usually, um, you know, the the small little issues were never able to be fixed and they led up to damage to the kidney themselves. And over a long time period of time, um, the kidney actually failed. So with acute kidney injury, um, it's a condition in which the kidney suddenly can't filter waste from the blood. Again, this is usually three months or less and usually caused by some sort of secondary issue that could be um, easily fixed. Um, what could cause it? Um, I put in here particularly hypertension and, and shock. Hypotension is obviously the, uh, the blood pressure being low, but it could be due to issues um, such as lack of fluid. If your patient is severely dehydrated, um, they're not going to have enough uh, circulating blood uh, or fluid, and that will actually cause the blood pressure to go down. Um, shock is that same problem, um, it, but on a much larger scale. With um, shock, it's it's for me the definition is um, low blood pressure and high heart rate. The low blood pressure is usually caused by um, the lack of fluid or uh, lack of um, the the heart ability to actually circulate efficiently. Um, but to compensate for that, the actual heart will um, become tachycardic in order to circulate what it does have more efficiently. So um, one of those hypotension or shock problems could be blood or fluid loss. Um, you know, you have a patient who um, hikes Camelback Mountain and 100. 12 degree heat and not drinking enough fluid, but sweating so much that they're actually losing that fluid. So they're not really replacing what they're losing. And because of that, that fluid loss will cause hypotension. And again, your heart rate will actually speed up in order to compensate for that. Um, other problems is bleeding. You know, you have a patient that comes in as a trauma, you know, they're severely bleeding somewhere. Um, again, their um, blood pressure is going to drop because there's um, less circulating blood. Um, and again, their heart rate's going to speed up in order to make what they do have more efficiently. Um, unfortunately, the kidneys are the first uh, organs that actually are shunted blood. So if you do have someone who comes in either severely hypotensive or come in because of some sort of shock or flu um, blood loss, the kidneys are the ones that are actually going to be affected first. Um, severe diarrhea, I put this in here just because, again, this is another example of someone actually losing enough fluid uh, but not replacing what they're losing and causing hypotension. Um, nausea and vomiting is another thing. You know, any orifice of your body that's expelling fluid but not um, – but not hold, either holding on to it or not being replenished from what they're losing is going to cause, cause fluid loss, which is essentially going to cause um, blood pressure to drop. Um, another cause could be a heart attack, heart failure, um, or other conditions leading to decreased heart failure. Um, this is because of the fact that if you do have someone who has low blood pressure and, you know, again, the body's supposed to increase the heart rate to make what it does have flow more efficiently, but if the heart's actually affected and can't speed up or uh, pump out the way it's supposed to, um, this will also cause um, circulation not to uh, flow as well. Um, so again, your hypotension is the low blood pressure, your tachycardia is to help make what you do have more efficient, but if the heart is now able to speed up the heart, then it's not able to really compensate for that. Um, organ failure, such as um, heart or liver, you know, again, if, you're, if your organs aren't working the way they're supposed to, to either filter or to circulate, then again, this is going to affect circulatory problems, and again, the kidneys are the, one of the major circulatory filtering uh, organs, so again, this is going to uh, cause some um, either acute problems or long-term chronic issues. 
So symptoms of acute uh, renal failure or injury, um, this could be decreased urinary output. Again, if your uh, patient is um, losing too much fluid, there's nothing to filter through the kidneys. So the body's going to hold on to what it possibly can, and then the kidneys aren't going to filter anything out. So again, you're not going to, um, your patient's not going to urinate the way they're supposed to. Uh, swelling due to fluid retention. Again, if the kidneys aren't working correctly, the fluid will actually uh, start to build up in the system. Um, Pathless resistance, the first place it probably will build up is actually going to be into the lungs, which, uh, which is going to cause other symptoms such as shortness of breath. Um, the nausea is probably going to be more of the toxin buildup. Um, again, if your kidneys aren't filtering the way they're supposed to, it's, it's going to have an overabundance of uh, toxins, and this is going to cause some nausea and vomiting. Uh, the fatigue is probably more of the, either the combination of the fluid buildup um, and the fluid volume overload or the fact that the heart's not able to uh, pump the way it's supposed to or it's putting more stress on the heart because it's pumping out all that fluid. Um, but it also caused some fatigue issues. Um, I want you to also keep in mind um, that when your kidneys aren't functioning correctly and the toxins start to build up, other things also start to build up. So not only are you getting a fluid volume overload because the kidneys aren't flushing out what you don't need, but it's also going to start holding on to the potassium and the sodium and the magnesium and the phosphorus and the calcium. So all those electrolytes are going to start backing up too. So um, when you're doing your studying and you're reading and your um, in your understanding of this process, uh, you know start to remember what hypernatremia um, and hyperkalemia um, look like because those toxins and those electrolytes building up are going to cause um, those uh, those symptoms. Um, patient can also have no symptoms but also experience um, um, whole body water electrolyte imbalance problems. So again, don't forget that you know, your potassium, your sodium, magnesium, phosphorus, all those electrolytes are not being filtered through, so they're going to have an overabundance of them. Um, you're also going to have um, an insufficient urinary production. Again, you know, the fluid volume overload is going to happen, and your kidneys aren't able to filter, so they're all, you know, all that fluid is going to start backing up. Um, diagnostic testing, um, you're obviously going to measure urinary output. Um, again, if your patient is severely dehydrated, you're going to give them um, lots of fluids to be able to get that hydration. But if the kidneys aren't functioning correctly, then that fluid has to go somewhere and it's not coming out. So you're going to measure urinary output because whatever goes in should be coming out. And if it doesn't, you got to figure out where that fluid went and what problems it's actually causing. You're going to look at your analysis. You're looking at the urinalysis to find out if, you know, maybe it isn't just a, um, a hypotension problem, but maybe there is some sort of infection. Maybe there is something else going on with the kidney itself that is uh, causing urine not to be produced. You're looking at blood tests. Uh, blood and, blood and creatinine are definitely two labs that you're looking at. Um, these two are actually telling you whether or not those toxins, or toxins are, are really backing up and whether or not your kidney is functioning. Uh, phosphorus and potassium, um, you're, you know, those are two major things because you're wanting to look to find out if uh, those electrolytes are actually being filtered. Uh, protein, protein is um, a very large molecule, molecule, so if the kidneys aren't functioning correctly, um, a lot of times those uh, proteins will uh, cause some damage to them too. Uh, GFR is glomerular filtration rate. Um, this is actually telling you um, or the physician that uh, as far as the kidney function itself. So it's not just a matter of whether the kidney is working or not. It's at what filtration rate is the kidney functioning at. So you can have somebody who has, um, you know, some slight um, kidney problems and it's at filtering at a 90% as opposed to 100% or it's filtering at a 50 as opposed to a 75. Um, so they're trying to determine not only is the kidney functioning, but what, what level is the kidney functioning at. They're also going to do some um, ultrasounds to find out um, the actual anatomy of the kidney itself, and then they may actually do a kidney bi biopsy looking for uh, whether it's tumors or whether it's uh, cancer or some sort of other problem that's causing uh, the kidney malfunction. Interventions, um, nursing is going to do, you know, either some uh, Lasix or furosemide. Uh, this will, you know, and this almost kind of doesn't make sense, but it does. So even though you may have either one kidney um, not functioning correctly um, or both, um, if you still have some sort of function, they will um, order some Lasix in order for your body to try to get rid of um, something. So um, if you have somebody who ha comes in with um, some, you know, uh, 
hypotension in some, um, and the labs are completely off, um, they may actually hydrate them first and then figure out where the labs are. And once that hydration problem has been fixed, to find out, you know, is the toxin still built up? Is there a lot of potassium? Is there a lot of sodium that's still in the system? They may give a you know, water pill or Lasix or a diuretic in order to um, allow the body to start to flush that stuff out. Um, other procedures is dialysis, and we'll talk about that later in some of the slides. Um, they also might do something called stents. Um, the stent is to actually help dilate um, things, whether it's a uh, stent that's placed in the kidney itself, whether it's stents placed in the ureters in order to dilate them so that way um, uh, stones can actually pass. Um, the stents are, are, are a mechanical fix to allow uh, urine to actually flow. Um, this could be because of um, either prostate issues. Um, you know, men who are older tend to have um, some... Um, uh, prostate hypertrophy, so that will cause some constriction on the urethra. Uh, a lot of times they'll put in some stents to be able to open that back up so that way um, urine will flow through a unconstricted urethra. Um, problems with the nervous system, I've had patients come in as traumas, um, special sp um, spinal injuries, and that will affect the nerves, which will not allow um, the patient to actually um, urinate on their own or allow the bladder to um, excrete um, urination. So a lot of times they'll put in stents in order to bypass that whole nervous system and just allow urine to flow. Uh, freely. Again, I mentioned the kidney stones. You know, again, if you have a stone that's stuck in a ureter somewhere, they'll place a, a stent to open up that ureter to allow that stone to uh, flow uh, better. And again, if you can remove the problem, that acute kidney injury will then go away and allow urine to flow, which allows the you know, kidney to function the way it's supposed to. Um, blood clots, um, I, I probably use the example, going back to the prostate problem, um, if you have someone who has an enlarged prostate and they actually remove it, um, this will cause um, some blood clotting because, you know, again, their body's trying to naturally heal itself, but those blood clots will cause some obstructions and they may um, have to put some stents in to allow those clots to actually flow. Um, Blood clots can actually happen in the kidneys themselves. Um, if that's the case, then they they will either put in um, stents to remove the clots throughout the body, allowing the kidney to work correctly. Um, they'll also probably put them on blood thinner in order to get those blood clots um, to either dissolve or put them on something so that way they won't actually, it'll prevent them actually from forming in the first place. Again, another uh, intervention is going to be fluid replacement. Um, if you have a patient who is severely dehydrated or having hypotension or some shock issues, you know they're definitely going to give them fluids to get that blood pressure back up, which will in turn allow their heart rate to come back down. Um, you're now fixing an issue that uh, once you hydrate them, you know circulation and blood supply will start to uh, go back to the kidneys the way they're supposed to. The kidneys will start to uh, flush the way they're supposed to, and again they'll start getting rid of the toxins and and the excess uh, electrolytes. So. Um, so here's the causes of chronic renal failure. Again, if you have a, an acute kidney problem that was not fixed or could not be fixed, then over time it will actually cause um, some chronic renal failure. But other reasons could be uh, type 1 or type 2 diabetes, um, high blood pressure, you know, the high blood pressure is causing um, the kidneys to, to work harder than they really should, and that, that eventually will tire out. Um, I mentioned the type 1, type, type, type 2 diabetes, um, whether they're controlled or uncontrolled. Um, you know, when you have a patient who's pushing thick, syrupy, you know, blood supply through kidneys, that's putting a lot of stress on them and a lot of damage. So again, they will actually start to wear out. Um, glomerular nephritis, um, which is an inflammation of the kidneys. Um, this is more of a, um, a, of a strep infection type problem and it causes um, internal damage to the kidneys themselves. We got interstitial nephritis, which is an inflammation of the kidneys um, and the tubules. Polycystic kidney disease, um, these are cysts that are actually um, causing problems within the, uh, the kidney and causing um, damage, not allowing them to, over time, um, function, and eventually that will cause uh, chronic problems. Prolonged obstruction of the urinary tract from conditions such as enlarged prostate, kidney stones, and some cancers. So again, this is um, you know a, a disease process that over time is actually causing problems with the kidneys. Uh, let's see here, vessel 
arterial reflux, uh, which is a condition that causes urine to back up to the kidney. So if you have a kidney that's actually, you know, producing um, the urine and filtering the toxins, but it's not able to actually get it out or whatever is coming out actually starting to reflux back into the kidneys, this now you're causing toxins to go back into something that will cause some damage. Um, and in recurrent kidney infections, again, your, your kidneys are trying to, you know, function the way they're supposed to. And if you add infections on top of that and, and infections that actually target the kidney specifically, then it will um, cause them to um, not function the way they're supposed to. Um, let's see here. Progressive irreversible kidney disorder that does not recover. This is chronic renal failure. So again, you know, this is, you know, something over a long period of time. Eventually it uh, causes damage to where your kidneys cannot recover from it. Um, I don't want you necessarily to... Um, specifically study and memorize all the stages, but just be aware this, you know, stage one, you know, you have a patient who has had um, some kidney issues, uh, whether it's acute and that were never fixed, that became a chronic issue over time that will cause some damage. And now they're looking to find out what's that glomular filtration rate. You know, it's functioning, but is it functioning at hundred percent? Is it 50 or is it not functioning at all? Uh, stage one is that the, the kidney is functioning at 90%, but not at a hundred. Um, and again, this could be caused by hypertension, diabetes, chronic UTIs, or a uh, genetic kidney disease. Stage two, it's usually um, 60 or 89 mLs per minute. Um, so your kidney is still functioning, but it's not functioning um, great. And then stage three and stage four, again, the the, um, the filtration is slowly getting worse or progressively getting worse over time. And stage five is the end stage. It's less than 15 mLs per minute. Um, and this is now, you know, your kidneys aren't functioning and, um, and you're now having to do other things. Now, whether it's medication, whether it's diet, um, it could be dialysis, there's, your kidneys aren't functioning and now it's a chronic issue and your physician and your nurses will actually start to do other things to um, um, fix that kidney issue um, because you still have to be able to get those toxins and those electrolytes out. Um, so here's a kind of a blurry, crappy picture of uh, the GFR as far as the different stages and as far as how um, much filtration they still have. <clears throat> So uh, kidney changes, we've got reduced GFR could cause um, abnormal urine production. Again, if the kidneys aren't functioning, uh, whether it's a, you know stage one or stage four, obviously the kidney is not functioning the way it's supposed to. It's not filtering the way it's supposed to. Um, and if it's not able to filter, um, which your body doesn't need, then obviously urine production is going to be slowed down. Um, it, obviously the toxins are gonna back up, so poor waste excretion. Uh, the backup of the electrolytes is going to cause the electrolyte imbalances. It's going to cause metabolic um, abnormalities. Um, your bun and creatinine are going to increase because the toxins aren't able to come out. And your output decreases causing fluid volume overload. Again, this is really kind of, I want you to keep it as simple as possible. Kidneys are not functioning. They're not filtering. And things that can't come out are going to have to go somewhere. And it's going to start poisoning in the body. And those electrolytes and those fluids um, are, and those toxins are really just going to be stuck. Um, so we talked about the electrolytes. So again, you're looking at hypernatremia, um, hyperkalemia. Um, start looking at um, the acid excretion um, and the metabolic acidosis. Um, your calcium decreases, which causes bone loss, and your phosphate actually increases. So for cardiac changes, um, again, the fluid has to go somewhere. It's not coming out, so it's going to cause hypertension, and this is due to sodium retention, so water follows salt. Um, so all that stuff is going to um, start backing up. It's going to go somewhere. So again, it's probably going to end up going into the lungs, and your um, your heart is definitely going to have to pump harder to be able to get that fluid um, circulating as best as it possibly can. So you're having sodium retention, fluid overload. Um, you're going to have hyperlipidemia, which is an increase in triglycerides. Um, your cholesterol is going to actually increase, and so is your LDL. Again, your heart failure, um, whether you have heart failure, which is now causing kidney issues, which is causing fluid to back up, or the kidneys weren't functioning, the fluid backed up, and now you're actually causing stress in the heart, which could actually cause heart failure. So now you've got two different um, you know, organs that aren't functioning the way they're supposed to, and now you've got much bigger problems. Hematological changes, um, we have a decreased uh, red blood cells. Um, your, again, your kidneys actually um, send the signal to your bones to be able to uh, produce more red blood cells. You know, it, it, that signal is that, that your urethropoietin, um, if the kidneys aren't functioning correctly, it's not able to send that um, uh, signal out. So the 
the blood cell will be decreased. Plus, the kidneys that aren't functioning correctly will do some damage to red blood cells, and they also will actually start to um, do damage to platelets. So that will cause uh, a low platelet um, circulatory problem. You will have um, an increase in anemia. So again, if you don't have red blood cells, then obviously that's anemia. And if if you don't have them, then your uh, anemia actually goes up. So first physical assessment of the chronic kidney disorder, um, you've got neurological issues, so it could be lethargy and drowsiness. Again, this is now a sodium um, and potassium problem. We've got cardiovascular, so we've got hypertension, peripheral edema, and heart failure. Again, that fluid has to go somewhere, so it's causing hypertension. Um, the fluid will either go into the lungs because it's path least resistance, or peripheral edema because of the fact that it's the furthest from the heart, and based on gravity, it goes down, but it can't really quite come back up. Um, and that um, the circulatory stress is going to cause some heart um, issues. Respiratory, again, pathways resistance, fluid backs up, it's going to cause tachypnea, pulmonary edema, pleural fusion, and crackles. For hematological problems, again, if your body can't produce enough red blood cells based on that signal, um, you're going to have a low um, red blood cell count. It's also going to cause um, some platelet destruction, which is also going to cause some bleeding and uh, bruising. For GI, you're going to have some nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and that's because of the fact that the toxins are building up. You're, you're getting the toxins which are making you nauseous. You're going to have um, some hypernatremia and hyperkalemia problems, which is also going to cause um, some nausea and uh, vomiting. With that vomiting, again, you're losing now fluid more than you were, and um, it could cause some um, hypotension. Uh, Even though the fluid is actually built up, it's not necessarily um, a... It's a circulatory problem, but it's not necessarily in the circulatory space anymore. It's now in the third spacing. So, um, you know, as much as you uh, vomit, you're not replacing the fluids that you lost. Um, so that's going to cause hypotension, even though the, the, the fluid, the excess fluid has gone somewhere else outside the circulatory problem. So it's going to cause some GI bleeding. Again, you're, you're low on platelets, so, you know, you're not able to clot the way you're supposed to, and this uh, can cause some GI bleeding. As far as physical assessment of chronic kidney disease, you're going to have uh, some urinary problems. So again, you're going to have, um, in the early um, stages, you're going to have polyuria. So your body's trying to, based on homeostasis, get rid of the fluid as much as it possibly can. So it may overly produce. But then again, over time, with all the damage and all the fluid back up and the um, heart and lungs not functioning the way they're supposed to, you'll actually start to have um, a urea. Um, you'll have uh, protein in the urine because of the fact that the kidneys aren't functioning correctly and that protein is going to start causing some damage. And then again, um, in the early stages, your body is trying to dilute the toxins as much as it possibly can and try to get rid of them. Um, but with um, dehydration and, um, and the kidneys not functioning correctly, it's going to start concentrating that and again, it's going to start backing up. Integumentary wise, um, it's going to have decreased skin turgor, dry skin, and ecchymosis. And that's because of that is now a dehydration issue. Uh, muscle skeletal, you have muscle weakness and cramping, bone pain, and possibly fractures. Again, this is now electrolyte problem. So you've got your sodium, and you've got your potassium, and you also have your calcium problems. So how do we fix these things? Uh, with end-stage kidney disease, um, we can actually do dialysis, which actually removes, removes excess fluid and waste products mechanically. And I'll show you a picture of this in a second. Uh, so basically, your patient is hooked up to a machine. It pulls their blood out. It filters it and pushes it back in, um, it, leaving behind the waste and the electrolytes that it doesn't actually need. Um, with uh, dialysis, it actually restores chemical and electrolyte balance, removes fluids from the overload that does not respond to diuretics. So Again, if you're giving Lasix to be able to get that stuff out and it's not working, they may actually uh, send your patient to dialysis, let the machine do all the work, and then they will feel better. Uh, dialysis, um, it, uh, let's see here, fluid overload can cause pericarditis and uncontrolled hypertension. So again, this makes sense. The fluid's backing up. It's causing you know, your um, patient to get hypertension. And um, with that, again, the fluid has to go somewhere. It's going to start filling in a lot of gaps. And one of them could be pericarditis. So this is fluid around the heart, which doesn't allow the heart to actually beat the way it's supposed to. So now it's really causing some stress externally on the heart. And now your heart is not able to pump more efficiently. 
So here's a uh, picture of hemodialysis. Again, this machine will, um, you know, you'll hook your patient up to this machine based on two different lines. Um, the first line will pull the blood out. You'll put it through the machine. It'll filter all the stuff that it um, that it doesn't need, and then with the second line, it actually pushes it back in. Uh, so see here, dialysis can be done in the hospital, clinic, or home. Um, so uh, you have a patient who will um, that has chronic kidney issues that will always be the beyond this and, and need it. We'll either do it every day, and this is every day based on. Um, you have to remember when they actually uh, take a patient who is fluid volume overloaded because their kidneys aren't working correctly. They'll hook them up to the machine that will pull the fluid off, and then they'll put what it. Um, it does need back into them, but that also leaves them with now a fluid volume deficit. Um, sometimes the body it can't handle that much fluid being taken off, so a lot of times they'll do every day and then just do a little bit of runs each day so that way their body can naturally adjust to it. If you have a patient who is on dialysis uh, for a very long time and their body is actually used to it, they'll do it Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, um, or Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday. This allows them to um, recover every other day than the, that they're not doing dialysis so that way um, it, it's not shocking their system but again Monday Wednesday and Friday or Tuesday Thursday Saturday it's actually um, still doing some sort of filter but again it's not trying to um, you know hurt their system by taking it all out um, at once or every day uh, let's see here blood flows in filtered and returned so again I told you that the machine you know will actually pull the blood filter it, and push back in uh, they'll also give heparin um, during dialysis or before dialysis, and this is really more of the uh, the stent itself, the AV fistula. Um, the AV fistula is a vein and artery that's sewn together. Uh, they give heparin so that way the AV fistula will stay uh, nice and patent and, uh, and clear, and it also thins out the blood enough that it flows better. So here's the vascular access. We've got AV fistula or AV graft. Again, they're sewing um, a vein and artery together so that way they're able to pull the blood from the vein, filter it, and push it back through um, for the artery. Um, it's usually uh, a radial or brachial um, artery and vein. It usually takes four months to actually mature. So even though they do this procedure, they can't just use it right away. They usually will give it some time for it to um, heal, uh, become very strong, and, um, and be able to be used. Dialysis is, um, is, is really hard on the system. It will pull blood from the body, filter it, and put it back in. But that pressure going back into the system might be too much for a normal vein or artery to take. So a lot of times it'll allow them to mature and get, um, let's say it's, make it tougher if you want to, so that we can actually take care of that pressure. And when you're assessing it, you should feel a thrill, which is a vibration, um, and you should hear a brew, which is actually a swooshing sound. So you will actually assess this. Um, you'll assess the AV fistula on a daily basis, especially uh, before and after dialysis to make sure that it's patent and it's working the way it's supposed to. Um, this is the lifeline in your patients. So uh, patients who are doing dialysis, this is a lifelong procedure. This is something they're going to do every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, or Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday. Um, or if they do get sick and they need to do it every day, this is the only way they're able to be fixed. So we want to make sure that it actually works, make sure that it's working the way it's supposed to, and uh, make sure that we do whatever we can to make sure there's no damage caused by it. Uh, so precautions, you know, uh, no blood pressure in the arm, uh, no IVs in that same arm, and the reason why is the blood pressure cuff um, with the pressure may cause damage to the AV fistula. You don't want to do any IVs in that arm because if that happens to infiltrate, that might cause some damage to the AV fistula. Uh, you're going to assess it every four hours to make sure that it is uh, patent and working correctly. You're going to assess circulation distally, so you want to make sure that, that even though they have an AV fistula that's working correctly, that the circulation for the rest of the arm is working correctly so you're you know te testing their fingers making sure that there's good cap refill making sure that they're nice and warm um, you, you want to make sure that, that um, the AV fistula that may be having a problem isn't affecting the rest of the arm you're going to encourage range of motion exercises um, the uh, more that they use that arm the more it allows circulation to um, flow freely not only just the AV fistula but as far as the rest of the arm itself Check for bleeding at the needle insertion site. Again, you're giving them heparin. You want to thin out the blood a little bit. Um, so when they do dialysis and come back to you, uh, once they've removed those needles, you want to make sure that those um, 
um, insertion sites aren't actually bleeding. And you're assessed for an infection. Again, this is just like placing an AV. You're, you know, the dialysis nurse will make sure that it's, you know, scrubbed very good um, and, and making sure that it's um, septic before they actually place the needles. But again, they want to make sure that there's no sign of infection or those insertion sites um, don't become infected because of the fact that we're poking them. So there's a picture of a uh, AV uh, fistula site. Um, they've actually already have something together, and this is actually in the process of healing. Um, again, they'll usually wait about four to six months uh, for it to get nice and strong and to heal correctly before they start to use it. Um, if they're waiting for that to actually uh, heal and become stronger, they may actually put in a temporary access site. Um, this is usually placed in the subclavian, the interjugular, or the femoral arteries. Um, again, they have uh, two ports, one's for blood to be pulled off and one's for blood to be pushed back in. Um, and again, this is something that they can actually have until that uh, fistula actually heals on its own. They also may give this to a patient who is going through acute renal injury. Um, a patient who comes in with symptoms of not feeling well for whatever reason and they find out that it's a kidney issue, they actually might put a, a temporary uh, dialysis port in um, just so that way they're able to emergently take them to dialysis, pull the fluid off the blood or the um, pull the blood out of the system, filter it, and push it back in, so that way they can start to, um, to recover much faster. Um, so dialysis isn't, isn't just for somebody who is chronic, but it can also be on a temporary basis too. So for nursing care, uh, prior to dialysis, um, you're definitely going to do blood pressures, you're looking at heart rate, uh, temperature, you're going to do vitals to make sure that you know there's no sign of infection, making sure their blood pressure isn't too low, and making sure that their heart rate is not too high. Um, you're doing this to make sure that the when they do go to dialysis, again, their dialysis is going to pull off the toxins and fluids. So if you have somebody who has a very low blood pressure and you send them down to dialysis, which is meant to pull the fluid off, and that will cause more low blood pressure now you have an issue. So it's not necessarily, they're not going to necessarily cancel the dialysis, but they may do other interventions to um, allow them to go down safely and still do the procedure. <clears throat> Um, I want you to keep in mind also that the dialysis is meant to filter. So if you give your patient all the blood pressure medications that are uh, pain medication or, um, you know, if you're giving your patient medications and it's in their system, but it's circulating and they go to dialysis and the whole point of dialysis is to circulate and filter their blood, it may filter out those medications. So giving them didn't do anything. So you want to make sure that um, the medications you give prior to dialysis are um, safe, making sure that they won't cause some sort of adverse reaction while they're in dialysis and make sure that you didn't just give a med for it to be filtered out and then it didn't do any good. Post dialysis, you're assessing for hypotension. Again, they're pulling out the fluid, they're actually pulling out the toxins, um, and they're only putting back what they need. So that might actually cause their blood pressure to go low. Um, it may cause a headache, uh, definitely some nausea and vomiting because their body's trying to adjust to the fact that, you know, if their body was used to a lot of toxins and it got used to that, and all of a sudden you took them away, your body didn't know what to do with it right away, and it might actually cause them to not feel well. Malaise is definitely um, going to be a symptom. Your patients are definitely wiped out when they come back from dialysis. Um, it may actually cause muscle cramps because of the low potassium. You're definitely going to check vital signs. Um, again, if they're pulling the blood off, uh, filtering it, and only putting back what they actually need, this uh, may cause um, some hypotension. You're looking at temperature for uh, possible infection from um, the insertion sites from the needles. Heart rate, if it's up, and your blood pressure is low, now you have a, a, a a hypotension or a shock problem. Um, and you definitely do weights. Um, fluid that's been pulled off will cause your uh, patient to actually lose weight. Um, that fluid was, you know, put somewhere and uh, the dialysis was meant to pull that off. So if you pull fluid off the circulatory system based on compensation, the fluid that was in the third space will go back into the circulatory um, um, space to be able to compensate. And that's what it's really meant, to, designed to actually do, is to be able to shift that fluid around. So the weight is to find out, you know, did they lose weight, which means that they, it means that they were actually not and no longer in fluid volume overload, uh, but also where did it go? And, um, you know, and if they're gaining weight, then obviously it didn't work at all and the fluid's actually still there. 
So now we have Hertz Neal dialysis. Um, this is actually for patients who are, um, I call them walkie-talkies. These are patients who are able to stay at home um, and able to do this themselves. So basically, they actually take a, um, a, a tube, put it into their peritoneal cavity with a port sticking out of their um, abdominal area. What this does is it allows the patient or someone to actually hook them up to a bag um, filled with diacetylate. Um, the diacetylate will actually go into the peritoneal cavity. It'll actually sit there for about six hours. It'll actually, based on os um, osmosis, actually exchange and be able to shift all that fluid. So if the body doesn't need it, along with potassium and sodium, and other electrolytes, it will um, push them into the actual peritoneal cavity. And then after about six hour period, they can actually open up that port and then basically all that diacetylate along with all the toxins and the excess fluid will actually drain into another bag. So peritoneal dialysis exchanges waste, fluids, and electrolytes in the peritoneal cavity. There's three phases. The first phase is to actually fill. So basically one to two liters of diacetylate will infuse by gravity over a 10 to 20 minute period into the peritoneal cavity. It will dwell, which means that it will actually stay in their system for about six hours. Um, they usually can do this at night while they're sleeping because, you know, for six hours, I mean, there's no point of staring at it. If they do it at night while they're laying down, this will actually work a little bit more efficiently. Um, and then when they wake up in the morning, they actually can drain it. So it drains the waste fluids and electrolytes. And again, they're really just going from hanging a bag of diacetylate, draining into the peritoneal cavity, letting it sit for about six hours, um, taking that bag off, putting another bag on, sitting it on the floor, and based on gravity, will actually empty that diacetylate and all the waste products and electrolytes back into the bag. And this usually takes about 20 minutes or so. Um, if you find that there, it's not draining the way it's supposed to, or if you find that it um, doesn't look right, um, then we've got some secondary issues. So complications can be peritonitis. Uh, this could be caused by the site contamination. This is a very, very, very sterile technique procedure. So the port that's hang hanging out of your patient, um, whether it's hooking a diacetyl bag up to them or actually removing the diacetyl from them and hooking another bag up, that is actually a very sterile technique. Um, and it, again, it's a uh, site for infection. It's a route for infection to kind of go into your patients. So they want to make sure that this is as sterile as you know, possible. If it does get contaminated, it could cause peritonitis. It can cause the, um, the port itself to be infection, uh, infected and causing infection in your patient. Um, symptoms of peritonitis um, include cloudy diacetylate. Uh, diacetylate goes in clear or it might have some sort of a yellow tinge to it, um, but once it actually goes in and dwells for six hours or so and actually comes out, it should come out at kind of like a urine color, uh, so a nice clear yellow. Um, but if it comes out cloudy, then that's this, um, a um, the sign of infection. If your patient has a fever, obviously that's a sign of infection. Uh, they might have abdominal tenderness um, or pain, which is the uh, peritoneal cavity itself becoming inflamed. Um, in order to actually determine whether there is infection caused by peritoneus or the actual port itself, they'll actually um, either swab or send the diacetylate um, to the lab to make, find out if there truly is some sort of um, infection. Um, you can also have uh, complications um, to the um, peritoneal dialysis itself. So as far as, you know, again, if it dwells for six hours and then you actually put another bag up and let gravity take over and allow the diacetylate to drain out, um, if it doesn't flow well, um, it might be either a positional problem with the port um, or it actually could be um, the, the the tubing inside the patient can actually have some sort of um, infection or some sort of, um, let's call it gunk, that's actually clogging that tube um, and not allowing it to actually flow. So um, another thing um, could actually cause the flow to not be well is uh, from constipation. It is in your peritoneal cavity, so if the intestines aren't um, flowing the way they're supposed to and they start to get swollen um, or if your patient gets bloated, this will actually cause um, some pressure on the peritoneal cavity which causes the flow not to work as well. So for nursing care, you're going to assess vital signs prior to the treatment. You're going to weigh your patient. Um, again, if they're you know starting off at let's say 200 pounds and after the diacetylate and the dwelling and the um, diacetylate um, 
uh, filtering and, and being removed, um, they should lose the weight. Again, this is meant to pull the fluid and the toxins off um, and put them back to some sort of normal daily weight. Um, observe outflow. There should be um, a continuous stream. So again, what goes in should go in a nice, um, easy stream. Dwell for six hours and come out in a nice, easy stream. Um, you're going to monitor inflow and outflow. Again, what goes in should be clear. and What comes out, it should be clear. And if it's cloudy or if it doesn't look right, then it's probably infected. So if all else fails, your patient will probably receive um, or need some sort of kidney transplant. Um, this is a candidate. Uh, the candidate must be free from medical problems. So uh, again, if your patient has gone their entire life with kidney issues and eventually those kidneys have failed, um, they are eligible for a kidney transplant, which is great. But if those secondary issues uh, were major problems that caused damage to the kidneys, that weren't fixed, then there's no point in putting a new kidney in them because those problems are going to cause damage to that new one all over again. Um, so the candidate must be free from cancer and diabetes. Um, the donor themselves have to be free from infection and disease, no cancer, no history of cancer, uh, no hypertension or kidney disease, inadequate kidney function. So again, the person who receives the kidney should not have problems that will cause damage or problems to the new kidney. And the person who actually donated the kidney should not have issues um, that once they give their kidney to someone else that will cause other issues because again, they're, they're now doing procedures and transplants on people that either will not receive it well or it will actually cause more issues. So as far as kidney transplant, uh, post-op wise, um, you're doing the physical assessment. When they do the tr kidney transplant, they don't actually remove uh, the old kidneys. They actually leave them there unless they're, you know, cancer or you know, or there's uh, issues with them. But again, if there is just that big of issues, they're probably not going to do the transplant to begin with. But if, um, if they can leave the kidneys that do not work there, then what they'll do is they'll put the new kidney in the abdominal area because there's more space. They can move stuff around. So again, you're looking as far as physical assessment, you're looking at incision site, you're making sure that they're actually, um, you know, free from infection and that that incisional site does not look infected. Uh, you're also looking at kidney functions. So you're going to look at their and creatinine. You're going to look at their electrolytes, making sure that those are within a normal um, limit. Um, your patient is going to definitely take immunosuppressive therapy drugs for the rest of their life to make sure that that um, donated kidney um, is not rejected. You're definitely looking for input and output. Um, again, the kidney is meant to actually filter, so the new kidney goes in. You want to make sure that that kidney is actually functioning properly. So if 2,000 cc's go in, 2,000 cc's should actually come out. If not, um, you know, that fluid's got to go somewhere and um, a very large uh, gap in, um, in, in input and output numbers uh, means that that kidney may not be functioning correctly. Um, you're definitely doing uh, daily urine uh, specimens to make sure that there's um, no infection. Um, there's probably nothing worse than giving you know, your patient receiving a new kidney and then getting some sort of infection or some sort of urinary tract infection uh, leading to polynephritis, then now causing damage to it. Complications could be rejection of the new kidney, uh, tubular necrosis, um, thrombosis. Again, your patient is just received a new um, uh, organ. There's uh, definitely some surgical um, possible complications, and one of them is uh, throwing blood clots, so you don't want that to happen. Uh, renal artery stenosis, um, you know, making sure that the blood flow is, is the, um, the way it's supposed to, and then obviously surgical wound healing. All right, so 45 minutes worth of uh, PowerPoint voiceover. Again, this is really just to give you a, um, a kind of a guideline to uh, the renal system as far as acute and chronic renal problems. Um, Keep it, you know, as simple as you possibly can. Again, the kidneys are meant to filter and to filter the waste and natural fluid. And when those don't um, happen the way they're supposed to, um, it's up to us to actually figure out how to fix that, whether it be medications, whether it's interventions, whether it's diagnostics, um, surgical problems. Um, you know, it's up to us to actually fix those things. So um, bring whatever uh, questions you have to class and we'll discuss it.